just double check that. We can hear you. Thanks, Josephine. Excellent. All right, welcome everybody. We might make a start. So I'll introduce myself in a moment, but I'd first like to begin today by acknowledging that we are meeting today on the lands of the Darug people, who are the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways in Westmead. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which those joining us online are meeting from and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. My name is Katrina Rose and I work at the Westmead Research Hub. The Westmead Research Hub exists to foster collaboration among our seven partners here at Westmead. Where we can collaborate, we aim to, and we offer opportunities for our researchers to work, learn, network together, and build on the shared strengths that we have here at Westmead. One of those core opportunities for collaboration is the access to our core facilities, which we will learn more about here today. Our facilities offer a range of cutting edge research and development services to support the needs of the medical research and biotech industry, including advanced microscopy, genomics, proteomics, flow cytometry, and much more. Maggie Wang, Director of Scientific Operations at Wimmer, will speak to the capabilities housed here at Wimmer. We'll then hear from Josh Studdart, Manager of Scientific Core Facilities at CMRI across the road there. He'll explain the technologies that are available at CMRI. Following this, we will hear from one of our technical experts and laboratory managers, Swat Dervish, to provide an overview of how the interactions between, these facil between facilities can operate and to provide an overview of the service and um, clinical findings that provide solutions to research questions for our researchers. Finally, we will hear about how the integration of multiple core facilities here at Westmead has impacted the end-to-end -end flow of research for Professor Andrew Harmon as a brilliant example of how ca our capabilities can take your research to the next level. Our facility managers will also be on hand at the end of this session to discuss any of the capabilities that you might be interested in today and answer any of your questions. The session is also being recorded today for future use, so be sure to share with any of your colleagues or someone within your network that might be interested in learning more about our core facilities. Now I'd like to welcome Maggie Wang, Scientific Operations Manager at Wimmer. Thank you, Kat. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here and uh, hello to the people online. So uh, as um, Kat mentioned, um, my role is oversee all the core facilities located at Wimmer. So firstly, I'd like to uh, give you a brief introduction about the Westmead Resource Hub. It's one of the largest health education research and training precinct in Australia. So as Kat mentioned, we have seven hub partners, including three research organizations, Westmead Institute for Medical Research. We have Children Medical Research Institute and Kids Research. We have two large um, hospital networks, one is Western Sydney Local Health District and uh, Sydney Children's Hospital Network. University of Sydney is part of the hub and New South Wales Health Pathology and recently um, joined CSRO. So at the campus, we have more than 1,400 researchers and students from over 140 research and clinical groups. There are nine hub core facilities located at Wimmer. So our mission is to deliver the best quality scientific support that enables and expands research capabilities at Westmead Precinct and beyond. I just like to share a bit of statistics to, to show how uh, utilization at our core facilities. In December 2022, we had 983 users from 234 groups and 40 organizations. So at that point, we're supporting 626 projects and we had more than 27,000 instrumentation utilized hours. So the 16 specialists in our scientific platforms team to support all the core facilities at uh, Wimmer. So the average experience in their specialized field is over 10 years. And what do we offer? We offer state-of-art equipment and technologies, 
the at always means cell imaging, electron microscopy, and preclinical imaging will provide full spectrum of imaging capabilities, from ultrastructure of the cells to live cells, large three um, D structure of organoid and whole tissue uh, scanning and deep tissue structures to the whole animal non-invasive imaging. Uh, Vesme cytometry, they provide high parameter, high speed, single cell analysis and sorting. For our analysis, we can run up to 50,000 cells per second. For single cell analysis, um, up to 50 parameters. For our cell sorting, we can do imaging cell sorting, single cell sorting, and up to six um, population bulk cell, cell sorting with a very high purity, in some cases, 100% accuracy. At Westmead Genomics, we provide gene profiling for targeted or discovery analysis. So we, we have our job um, digital PCR to detect the rare gene targets, and our nanostring can detect gene expression panels up to 800 genes. Our next gene sequencing can detect the whole genome, targeted DNA sequencing, RNA seq. We also have uh, capability for single cell genomics by collaboration with CMRI facility and the recently, most recently, spatial transcriptomics. Uh, we have a number of uh, cutting edge technologies um, that allow our researchers to use advanced capabilities to design. Uh, research projects where um, were well, impossible in the past or any other facilities in Australia. So a few examples here, as you can see, we had early access um, technology imaging cell sorting at cytometry and the fully automated liquid nitrogen storage system and also the recent recently installed on Google digital light. We also provide training programs and education events. 76 developed instrument, software, and technical training programs offered at call facilities covering basic to advanced levels. So we run monthly user group meeting at every second Friday of each month. So to provide the latest development, development of all the platforms and also uh, have one invite provide uh, uh, to give a technology focused scientific stories. The upcoming one will be on April 14th. The workshops and seminars we work with to focus on the latest technology development and meet the needs of our researchers. They also provide educational uh, seminars. The next one is the introduction of flow cytometry principles on March 31. So please join us if you're interested. Specialized and the customized services and end to end service packages. For all the facilities, our highly qualified specialist team will provide advice on your project um, experimental design. We also provide um, protocol testing or pilot study based on your needs. At Westmead Bar Bank, we have a complete solution for your specimen management. From the sample receipt shipping, sample processing, and the sample storage at different conditions. We also have data inventory system to manage all the information related to your specimens. Best me about resources facility, they provide the support for preclinical research support. So our specialists can provide advice on your animal ethics applications. We provide animal care equipment preparation, decontamination, animal orders, and transportation requests. We also provide animal handling, um, trainings, and specialized animal services as requested. Histology have a full spectrum of um, histology technologies. And um, we can do from end-to-end -end tissue processing, sectioning, and standings. A lot of special stands available at uh, our histology. Bioinformatician also provide data analysis and the visualization on genomics, cytometry, proteomics data sets, 
for bulk or single cells. There are a list of examples of analysis we can do by our information, but a lot more not listed here. So data visualization is been developed by our bioinformatician Brian, and he is continuing working on more. So I think our scientific platform very strong collaboration. So we like to collaborate with researchers and especially across all platforms. We have developed a number of end-to-end uh, -end, um, workflows based on researchers' needs that provide researchers a single point of contact to access all technologies and customize services across all platforms, start from experimental design to the manuscript support and report support. There are some examples of service packages. Again, it's based on the research needs we have developed here. So if it's not covered for your needs, please happy to work with you together. Our facilities are open and equal to So regardless of affiliate. Our open hours um, is listed here, but after our access is also available up, upon request. So the access is um, where uh, online first come and first serve. So why use WestMe up co facilities? Because we are highly qualified, innovative, efficient, responsive, flexible, friendly, and collaborative. I was here because I'm so proud of the team. So remember, please, we are here to support you. For more information, um, up website and you can access by QR code as well. So you can also email our scientific platforms at wema.org.au. So I'm looking forward to your questions and to Contact us, um, or after the session in the networking session after this. All right, so now I'd like to introduce Josh Studdart, who is um, the manager of scientific core facilities at CMRI, Children's Medical Research Institute, just next door to us here. Josh, come on up. Can I clip it? Ah, that's better. I can use my hands and wave around like a lunatic. Excellent. Um, right, there's a few of you here. I am not nervous at all. Um, so I was speaking to Kat earlier, and um, so I was explaining to her how I was running through this talk uh, last night with my daughter, and she provided me with all of this incredibly positive feedback here. Um, she's 10 years old and her key feedback was make sure you don't tell people the slides that you hate. I'll say good and try not to swear. So I have no recollection of using any course language, but um, I will be very aware of that. And my aim today is to not offend people and to give you an overview of the core facilities um, at the Children's Medical Research Institute. So I've been floating around the Children's Medical Research Institute for about 17 years now. Um, and during that time, I've worked in some research uh, capacity, some operations capacity, and also in the core facilities. Uh, the one thing that I've learned over the past 17 years is core facilities are hugely specialised laboratories with specialised equipment. They offer specialised services and they have specialised staff. So staff that work in these facilities um, 
they've taken a lot of the pain out of doing experimental processes. They've done the troubleshooting, they've done the sample prep, they've done the optimization, they've learned how to use the instruments, they know people in the field, they know the field well, they know the suppliers, and they know how to get the best out of your uh, samples for the experiments that you're doing. So if I could just use a real example of how I've used core facilities in the past. Um, a couple of years ago, I was working as a researcher. Um, we went to look at uh, expression levels of, and spatial distribution of a specific protein. So rather than do the collaboration thing with labs and, and get cells from different labs, um, we went directly to Cell Bank Australia, obtained a list of the cell lines that they have available at Cell Bank Australia. Um, on, on site at CMRI and then went through that list and, and identified the ones that were of interest to us. So we got Cellbank to thaw the cells, expand the cells and then freeze the stocks. But during that expansion phase, um, they were kind enough to give us an off cut of the cells where we could continue on and, and almost fast track the, the experiments that we were doing. So we used the biomedical proteomics facility uh, to run our, our proteomic screen and I have no idea about prote proteomics at the time so I was able to talk with Mark Graham and George Kraft who, who were managing the facility at the time, Mark's managing it now, um, and get advice on how to prep the samples which was fantastic and at the same time I was able to talk to Will Hughes from CMRA Imaging and get some advice on the microscopes that we should be using and also get some training uh, for the junior staff in uh, who'd be working on these, this experimental data set. And the end result was a really nice complementary data set uh, with the biomedical, uh, with the proteomics and with the image analysis. Uh, and that's about all I can say because I've signed a lot of forms so I can't talk about too much of it. Um, but the point is, if you utilise uh, the, the core facilities throughout CMRI and indeed the Westmead Research Hub, it can fast track uh, some of your research aims and goals. So CMRI has 10 core facilities, uh, bioresources, CMRI imaging, stem cell and organoids, peptide synthesis, cell bank, single cell analytics, vectorology, genome engineering, biomedical proteomics and bioinformatics. So I'm just going to give a really quick um, overview of each of the facilities and introduce you to the facility leads and hopefully give you um, a little bit more information on how to get into the facilities and how they can best be utilised. So the biomedical, oh dear, that was cut off Mark's email address. Um, the biomedical proteomics uh, facility is actually part of the Westmead Research Hub core facilities. It's not um, a, a CMRI independent core facility. And I should say here that the CMRI core facilities are here for all of Westmead Research Hub users. So please don't be um, put off by them not being core. Um, Westmead Research Hub core facilities. So the biomedical proteomics um, core facility has two mass specs and a whole lot of instrumentation that goes along with those mass specs. The services that Mark offers are deep proteome analysis, deep phosphor proteome analysis, targeted protein analysis, and small molecule detection and quantification. Um, that's not the end of the story. Mark also does custom projects. Um, so if you're interested in doing anything that out, that's outside of these services, please talk to Mark. And he can offer training uh, to offer to be independent user of the, the, the mass specs as well. So any, any, any uh, questions you've got for proteomics, please uh, contact Mark Graham. So Cell Bank Australia is all about uh, quality and integrity of cells. Um, so they have over 900 cell lines that are currently stored at CMRI for distribution. So Cell Bank Australia with these cell lines, if you get lines from them, they've been through the process of uh, optimising the culture conditions. So you know how to culture them properly and you know how to get the best out of the cells. The other good thing about Cell Bank Australia cell lines is if they are difficult to, sell, to grow cell lines, um, you're not left in doubt you can contact Cell Bank and they can say, well, yes, this line was a little bit slower growing than all of the other lines, or um, yes, this kind of looks a little bit weird sometimes. So that's, it's a resource um, that you, it takes the, the stress out of growing cells sometimes. Um, they offer secure storage, cell line authentica authentication, uh, mycoplasma testing, IDA patient deposit, and also custom culture. So if, all of these contact details have become cut off, which is okay. 
Okay, fantastic. Um, so if you've got any questions, if you've got any cell lines that you might be interested in, please contact Sam and Elsa from uh, Cell Bank Australia. CMRA imaging, um, there's a lot going on in this slide and a lot of uh, different types of instrumentations that are available for, for using that CMRA imaging. Um, what I will say for this is it works on a large scale and a real small scale. So you can see these um, images here, they're from a seven and a half day mouse embryo using the light sheet uh, uh, microscope that's um, currently housed at CMRI. So these are larger samples. And then if we look at these ones down here, this is going on to a molecular level. So this is a super resolution scale at CMRI as well. So we've just recently had the Tausted Falcon on the Stellaris 8 installed to be able to give super resolution capabilities. So the spectrum of, of um, microscopes that are available for use is, is quite large. Um, Will Hughes is the facility manager there. He offers um, customised training for the microscopes. So his, his way of doing the training is uh, really getting to know the project and then just kind of helping you decide which microscope to use and then providing full set, uh, full training for those microscopes with the um, intent of, of getting you up and running as fast as possible and generating data. Our single cell analytics facility is run by Megan Weatherstone um, and it offers a range of 10X uh, services that are compatible with the 10X chromium controller that we have at CMRI. So some of the research that's come through, um, some of the projects that have come through the, the facility, uh, uh, tissue and cell profiling, um, immunology projects, embryology project, um, cancer research, disease biology, and classifying rare cell populations. So if you have any questions regarding single cell uh, genomics, uh, please contact Megan, but also please contact Joey Lay and Sui as well for, for their help and advice in, in setting up these projects. Moving on to the vectorolo vectorology facility. So this was uh, the vectorology facility and genome engineering facilities were set up a number of years ago at CMRI by Leszek Lazowski. Um, so the aim of these facilities was to provide um, viral vectors for academic research and then move those into a preclinical uh, research lab to, to do process development and eventually um, move these programs into translational programs. So Betty, who runs the facility, uh, does small and large scale uh, AAV, Lenti and adenovirus. Um, production and they can also assist with um, doing plasmid, plasmid preps, cloning and digital drop for titering. The genome engineering facility um, offers a wide range of uh, genome editing services for, for different cell types, so iPS cells, um, the modelized cell lines and, and any other cell lines that you might be able to think of. Um, so they offer knockouts, knock-ins, endogenous tagging, point mutation, RNA editing. So contact Ray, who's just sitting at the back there quietly for, for any advice on, on how to um, projects. Our newest facility is the peptide um, synthesis facility. So if you're interested in proteomics, um, stimuli response, drug discovery, our drug delivery. Uh, please talk to Hassan, who's here, I think. Yes, he is. I can see him. Um, and he'll be able to help you out with that. Um, he's got a lot of instrumentation uh, to be able to support small scale, uh, medium, and large scale calcium peptide uh, production. So this brings us to an eyes facility. Uh, so the stem cell and organoid facility at, at the Children's Medical Research Institute. So this is an end to end. Um, workflow for for generating and analyzing uh, organoids which are three-dimensional mini organs in a dish if you like um, so it starts right from the beginning so reprogramming the pbmcs or fibroblasts expanding them reprogramming them doing some uh, expansion and basic characterization to make sure that they are indeed ips cells and then they move into the next phase which is differentiating them into a uh, a specific lineage to um, move the, 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 the organoid of choice that you're looking for. So 
Anae's uh, facility successfully been able to make cardiomyocytes, cardiac, cardiac organoids, hepatocytes, liver organoids, kidney organoids, lung organoids, and brain organoids. So please contact Anae um, and I. I keep getting that wrong. Um, if you have any uh, questions or any projects that require organoids or even um, iPS cells. And this brings us to our bioinformatics facility. So I would strongly encourage everyone uh, to engage with some sort of bioinformatician, regardless of where they're from, um, at the beginning throughout process of your project and at the end of your project because they are amazing people who find the data that you you generate and and interpret it in such a way that that gives it huge amount of meaning um, so our bioinformaticians so have skills with single cell analysis bulk transcriptomics analysis iggy's into proteomics and phosphoproteomics um, Lee is our imaging analysis person at the moment, um, but they do all cover these different types of analysis. Um, they have unlimited resources for computing and data storage using the Oracle Cloud Computing, um, and they have fast turnover of results and can also assist in writing up manuscripts and reports. So just some housekeeping. Um, as CMRI as research facilities, we do require a research brief to be submitted before we start any projects. Um, so this gives the project our outline um, and also uh, alerts us to any government's requirements that we may need to look into and any WHS considerations as well. Applied for independent usage of instruments, so for any of the microscopes or mass specs um, and the core facility uh, um, provide training for, for those instruments. Um, so please contact any of the core facility leads um, or myself and we'll be able to help you, point you in the right direction. And it's not just about one core facility. These core facilities all work uh, together and can really make a big impact on, on your experiments and your projects. So just also like to acknowledge all the hard work of our facility staff, not only at CMRI, but also throughout the whole Westmead Research Hub. They do fantastic work and they support uh, fantastic uh, research that goes on at the Westmead Research Hub. Finally, um, if you have time on the 3rd of April, please join us for our single cell genomics workshop. Um, it's going to Research Institute. We'll have talks from technical talks from Joey, Brian, and also some user stories from a couple of the researchers, Pragarthi and Anai, uh, at the Children's Medical Research Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Any questions just before Josh sits down? Excellent. Thank you so much. Great. I'd now like to bring up Suat Dervish, who is the manager here at Westmead Cytometry, Imaging and Electron Microscopy. Cool. Good morning. Uh, I'm up here today because I am fortunate to be part of a team of seven cytometry and imaging specialists here at the Westmead Research Hub. And our main goal is to not only provide high end instrumentation, a lot of which are shown here on the screen, a lot of which are firsts and, you know, pretty unique, not only in Australia, uh, also in the Asia Pacific region as you've heard uh, Maggie mentioned previously, but also to provide the service, the support, and essentially provide capabilities to researchers here to generate quality data. And this quality data is to be generated with the aim of helping to translate our medical research. 
So my role, as I mentioned, is not only to ensure that we are up to date and providing world leading instrumentation to researchers here, but in also allowing capabilities to be provided to researchers. And it's really important to make that distinction between instrumentation and the provision of instruments um, in contrast to the provision of capabilities, which is really provided by the staff and the support that the Westmead Research Hub puts into these core facilities. So we provide a number of different capabilities ranging from immunofluorescent imaging to spectral cytometry to live cell microscopy that adds the time domain onto microscopy experiments all the way through to uh, whole mouse in vivo imaging. Um, we provide lots of different capabilities, including the ability to sort single cells, uh, a lot of different analysis options, all the way to technology that includes deep learning approaches to help researchers really analyze the quality data that we help generate here at the core facility. So the Westmead cytometry facility allows researchers to analyze single cells in a hydrodynamically focused stream of liquid. Essentially, cells are passed through a laser one at a time, and as each cell passes those lasers, signals are collected and recorded and mapped back to each cell. Now, the cytometry facility is the most utilized core facility at the hub. And if you ask me why, the, the reason or the main reasons are, are pretty simple. It's because this technology is quite sensitive, meaning that we can detect subtle changes between different populations of cells. It's quantitative, meaning that for each cell that passes through these lasers, we get a quant quantified uh, measure of the signal that is coming off that cell. It's high throughput because we can detect tens of thousands of cells per second and record information on those cells. It's multi-parameter, meaning for each event that passes through those lasers, we get multiple parameters of information, uh, up to 50 on some of our advanced analyzers. And in cytometry, the this technology is, is faxable. And by faxable, I mean, not only can we analyze the cells, but we can decide to, whether we want to isolate specific populations of, of cells. So the advanced cell analyzers and cell sorters at the Westmead Research Hub allow, allow for the acquisition of information on millions upon millions of cells um, at extremely rapid rates of up to and over 40 to 50,000 cells per second. For cell purification, which is what our cell sorters do, we can reach high purity, um, allowing these high purity populations that have been sorted for, to, for researchers to go and perform downstream functional assays. And our cell sorting facility can not only separate single populations, but we can separate multiple cell populations simultaneously from very complex samples. So one example uh, here is from Dr. Han Shen from the Translational Radiation Biology and Oncology Group, where the focus is really on understanding chemoradiation resistant cell populations in colorectal tumor. And, and this kind of information is useful to, or will be useful to guide management as well as different regime treatment changes um, and, and clinical decisions. So in these experiments, uh, resected human colorectal cancer tissue is obtained from, from patients at the clinics. And these samples are, are shown here, and they're quite complex. They normally contain lots of debris, doublets, and identified cells. So these samples can be processed, stained, brought to our cell Cyto uh, our Westmead cytometry core facility and put through our imaging cell sorter, which is one of the instruments and capabilities that we provide at the core facility. The samples can cross through those lasers and we can generate data. And in this case, the cells were stained uh, very simply with DAPI to identify live cells, which are the cells here on the left, as well as CD45 to identify the immune population. We can then apply a gating strategy to the events that are flowing through the cytometer and end up sorting very pure 
single cells, which the researcher requires for downstream RNA seq as, uh, assays, which the samples are brought over to the single cell facility at CMRI that Josh mentioned uh, just earlier. And what I'd like to highlight here is really the importance and what the imaging aspect provides, which is the novel technology that we have here. Um, it allows us to really distinguish between nice single cells and uh, doublets and identified cells, uh, unidentified cells, um, to be able to provide the researcher with a quality output that they're able to work with. So uh, that's that's fine, but we can also uh, utilize the imaging technology when the researcher is after a CD45 negative population, which is not as well identified. Um, and so what I'm trying to show here is that on the CD45 negative population, a lot of the events that would normally be gated out without this technology, we can apply a size gate to segregate different non-immune cell populations into populations that we can then go on and sort, again, providing to the researcher. So the sorted cells will be taken to the single cell facility, sequenced, and essentially uh, the workflow includes our in-house bioinformatician who can process and analyze the data uh, and resulting in identification of different immune populations as well as non-immune populations and the generation of a whole heap of RNA signature data from these different populations which can feed back to help understand those chemo-resistant cell populations. Now the Westmead Imaging Facility uh, encompasses what you are already familiar with, microscopes, um, but I'm trying to highlight here that it also encompasses electron microscopy, which is hidden in the hospital, um, all the way through to the, our preclinical imaging facility, which houses our whole body um, IVIS imager. And so these advanced tools and their accompanying expertise uh, providable, providable by staff are in place to really help you get the most of what these high-end instruments can provide. So Gemma Wilson, a PhD student from CCR at Wimmer here, is interested in differentiating between non-invasive breast cancer and from the invasive type, and, and really looking at how biomarkers can be used in the prediction of progression between the two different types. So here at the Westmead Research Hub, we have a slide scanner, which allows for large area scanning. And that's what uh, this researcher really required um, to image the whole biopsy, to be able to identify larger structures, but still have high resolution to zoom down in, um, and to be able to process a lot of samples uh, with, with high throughput. So these biopsy samples uh, can be stained and imaged using the slide scanner, um, and the slide scanner, as I mentioned, provides for the large area, high res and, and high throughput. And so, um, essentially, this example here shows the transition to the invasive phenotype um, and the ability to identify uh, the difference using the biomarkers, which are labeled in, in green and red. And, and mainly, it's that in the tissues that are transitioning, there is a loss of the red biomarker in here. And so if this project's hypothesis is confirmed, um, the, this patient would be recommended to undergo surgery uh, and radiation therapy as a personalized treatment. So in our preclinical imaging facility, the cellular cancer therapeutics group are able to use our whole body imager to track the growth of tumors in murine models. And so the cancers that they've worked up the model for here are bioluminescent, uh, giving off light that is uh, quite easily detected via the whole body imager. And so what uh, is, is shown here is the establishment of the model um, with images being shown from day six to day 17, showing the growth 
of the tumor, which is able to be quantified using the whole body imager. Now, one, upon establishment of this model, the group can then go and apply various treatments and quantify whether that tumor has reduced or uh, is, is remaining. And essentially, um, this highlights the application of this instrumentation. The isolated organs can also be imaged using the same instrument, and this allows the researchers to track the, the distribution and where the uh, tumor essentially is in these different tissues. So another example from our preclinical imaging facility is from uh, Farhana Azmi from CTRR at Wimmer. And they're interested in looking at the biodistribution study of nanoparticles um, that are injected into mice. And so here we're showing that this tool uh, labeled nanoparticles with an immunofluorescent dye can be successively tracked via the whole body imager. And so um, th this is quite important because this now allows them to have a tool to track the biodistribution of the nanoparticles post-injection. And they're quite excited uh, to take this research to the next level because now that they have this and they can show that it does actually track to the tumor, they can go on and um, apply different treatments and check how that nanoparticle functions. So the electron microscopy facility here also is is available at the hub and the facility can be used to study viruses down to the nanometer scale. And so bacteriophages are being trialed here uh, at the Westmead precinct as a potential treatment for antibiotic resistant bacteria. And so this technology and this capability allows our researchers to utilize it to um, image different bacteriophages. And this enables researchers to establish the family along with characterization of the size, shape, and capsid between different viruses. So the last example I'll show is a combination uh, undertaken by multiple different core facilities, uh, including Biobank Histology Imaging, which is our part, uh, Genomics, uh, Service Provider for Sequencing, and our in-house bioinformatician. And so in this end-to-end -end workflow, uh, which is essentially the workflow for the Vizium assay, a tissue block can be sectioned, QC'd, uh, imaged, uh, and then a library prepared for downstream sequencing. And so in this example, malignant mesothelioma tissue from, from lung, from a set of patients who had received immune checkpoint inhibitors, are placed on a slide. And on the slide, there are little uh, sections of uh, sequences. And essentially, once the library is prepared and sequenced, the it, different populations on the tissue can be identified. And then what can be performed is the information can be mapped back onto the original image that was taken of, of the slice. And so the ability to map back T cells and tumor tissue back onto the slide really allows the researcher to explore and understand the immune interactions that are occurring post checkpoint inhibitor um, treatment. And so, uh, you know, this is very useful also for downstream biomarker discovery. And this work was from Dimitri Shek and Scott River at Liver Immunology. So I'm going to end there. Um, I just want to leave it with you know a whole list of the different instru instruments that are available here but the take-home message that it's not only instruments that need to be here it's the support uh, that we provide that the hub provides and this allows us to provide the capabilities and our overarching aim is to allow researchers to generate quality data throughout the capabilities that are provided here thanks Thank you, Sui. Now we'll get back.
from Ken Common. Uh, not that one, sorry. Uh, where's the get the desktop? Okay, so we're working right. Okay, so up on level six and Center for Virus Research, um, we have really maximized the opportunity of working at a precinct where we have medical research institutes or to hospitals. And we have formed partnerships with 30 surgeons across 20 hospitals, but mainly at Westmead, so that we can ha get access from the operate, uh, from human tissue from the operating theatre in our lab, which is a six minute walk away. Um, you can see obviously this is Wimmer and here's the operating theatres here. And what that means is that within 15 minutes of its removal from the body, we can get access to a whole range of human tissues. These are the tissues that my research group uses, which are all of the different tissues that a sexually transmitted pathogen might encounter during transmission. So these tissues are obviously normally very, very difficult to obtain, but we get these, these tissues from a whole range of different operations. And we actually use these tissues to look at a whole range of different disease settings. And today I'm going to be focusing on um, the work that Kirsty Bertram or I do with also with Tony on uh, sexual transmission of HIV. And this is just a picture of Kirsty and I and various others in the operating theatre with uh, some of the surgeons that we collaborate with. But I think really that is just the fantastic thing about working somewhere like this is that is that you really can have very, very meaningful uh, partnerships um, with clinicians to do really you know, very translationally relevant research, because obviously what, if, if you want to look at how a disease is actually transmitted, there's no point in looking in a mouse, particularly something like HIV, where, where, where mice don't catch HIV. Human beings are the only people that catch HIV. So you need to be able to do things in a translationally relevant setting. So when these tissues come back to the lab, we do two different things. We either, we either extract the uh, immune cells from these tissues, and we've spent a long time optimizing protocols to do that, or we topically apply viruses to the tissue for in situ studies. And I was going to give you a few very brief examples of how we've used the hub core facilities um, to do this. So it needs something that you need to remember when you're looking at human tissue work is that it's very difficult to do because unlike working with blood or cell lines or whatever, uh, these cells are very firmly embedded within the tissue. So if you want to get the cells out of the tissue, it, it requires a lot of skill because so you have to use enzymatic digestion. The problem with enzymatic digestion is that the enzymes you use to get the cells out, which cleave uh, collagen usually, also cleave the cell surface markers on these cells. And that's a problem if you want to really accurately identify them, whether it be by flow cytometry or whatever else. Um, it also functionally alters them. So ripping a cell out of its native environment um, functionally alters it and often kills them. So we've spent about 15 or 16 years optimizing protocols to really minimize each of those problems. And here is an example of one of the things we do when we get a new tissue or design a new flow cytometry panel is that we have to test a whole range of different uh, tissue digestion enzymes to work out which is the correct enzyme that will not um, cleave the markers that you want to use. So this is a case of an innate lymphoid cell panel. And in this case, you can see type D collagenase is the correct enzyme uh, enzyme to use. Had we have used type P, it would have it would have cleaved all of these markers here, um, which means that when you went and did your flow cytometry, you'd be misidentifying the cells. Um, we've worked up a whole range of very high parameter flow cytometry gating strategies using the FAC symphony to look at mononuclear phagocytes, innate lymphoid cells, tissue resident T cells, tissue resident B cells, and others. This is an example of one of the gating strategies that we published last year, which is a 25 parameter panel to look at innate lymphoid cells. And we're just about to publish a 32 color um, strategy to look at every different subset 
a mononuclear phagocyte. And the nice thing about this technology, system where you can't genetically modify things, you can't you can't um, create mice that fluoresce green, etc. Um, is that we can very very using these protocols, we can very very accurately define the precise markers that these cells express, and we can really accurately define the cell subsets in these tissues. There's been a huge amount of confusion in the literature. Um, because people misidentify cell subsets because they've cleaved the markers. We can also define, in our case, HIV binding um, receptor expression, which means we can actually look at the relative proportion. That's the other nice thing about these very high parameter panels where you can where you can gate on 20 or 25 different cell subsets. You can actually compare and contrast those cell subsets within a piece of tissue. And of course, as Sue was saying earlier, the great thing about Wimmer is we have these amazing um, fact sorters, which means we can then drill down on these cell populations, sort up to six at a time, and we can do functional assays on these cells, including virus uptake assays or immu immunological assays, such as T cell proliferation assays or intracellular cytokine assays. Um, so I want to give you just an example of, of something that we discovered recently. So these green cells here, are called Langerhans cells. These are a very, very specific immune cell that live in the epidermis of our skin or the, or the, or the outer epithelial surface of our genital tissues. Now, previously, these green cells called Langerhans cells were thought to be the only cell population present within that tissue. But what um, our, our use of real human tissues and gating strategies allowed us to show was that, in fact, there are three different immune cell populations. Uh, the, the, the additional ones being this blue one here and this black one here. Um, and we use these, these very high parameter gating strategies to find these cells. This is obviously just showing a few parameters. And then what we did was we used the RNA-seq in the genomics facility to show that the green cell, that, that, that the, the, the black cells here are transcriptionally very similar to the Langerhans cells, whereas the blue cells are transcriptionally similar to a different kind of cell a dendritic cell in the in the deeper dermal tissue. Um, so this was quite a big finding. It was a brand new subset that was very, very specific to human genital tissues. And then a couple and then last year, another group discovered the same, same population, but completely ignored our study, published it in immunity, um, and they literally described the same cell that we had described, but they called it a Langerhans cell which it wasn't. So we were quite irritated by that. So we, uh, during the COVID lockdown, downloaded lots of publicly available data sets, made the most of the bioinformatic analysis uh, help that we could get here. And we showed that in, the, in their own data set and someone else's data set, that there were clearly Langerhans cells and dendritic cells in the epidermis, which ultimately came to our advantage because we were able to get our own immunity paper uh, where we basically rebutted what they said, and we really definitively showed that these cells are a dendritic cell and not a Langerhans cell. Um, moving on to the microscopy side of things, um, one of the key problems when you're working with a virus is that they are far, far too small to see with a microscope or a flow cytometer, unless you're using an electron microscope, but obviously that's literally one parameter. Um, um, Heva Bahalu did um, in our group was he optimized this technology called RNA scope, where you basically use fluorescently tagged um, probes that bind to the viral RNA. And then you can then amplify that system, which enables you to see single virions of HIV. And the problem previously is that because viruses are so small, it would you, you can't really detect them until enough viral replication has occurred that the signal is bright enough. So usually you can't see any virus in a human tissue for about 72 hours. Obviously, 72 hours is way, way, way after the initial transmission event. So we worked up this technology and you can see these brand new cells that we discovered here, these epidermal dendritic cells extending out uh, processes to sample HIV. This is in, in red that we have topically applied to the foreskin, inner foreskin. So again, this is foreskin that's come off somebody's body. 15 minutes later, it's in our lab. We've added the uh, virus. And then 30 minutes later, we've captured these images of these cells reaching out and sampling HIV on the surface. You can see here one of these cells extending out an arm 
and, and interacting with a single virion of HIV. I always feel, feel quite excited when I see these pictures because I, I really sort of feel that, that, that this here is literally the moment that HIV transmission occurs, which we were able to capture. We were, we were the first people to ever capture these images uh, prior 72 hours, and we're looking at 30 minutes uh, after the virus has been added. Um, and then using our, again, using the fact sorting, we sorted these cells along with all the other cells out of the tissue. And again, we showed um, ex vivo that indeed it is these cells, which are actually shown in blue here, but green here, that it is these, these new cells that we discovered, which are the cells that capture HIV, uh, not these green Langerhans cells, which is what we is what previously were thought to be the main transmitting cells. And these two, and 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 th this that was just an example of one cell. We actually found three different cells, which we published in in two uh, papers in Nature Communications in 2019 and 2022. And the other nice thing about the, the way we've been able to use this very very high parameter stuff is that we've been able to go back through the literature. And we've been able to reinterpret the previous findings in the context of these much higher parameter strategies to really say, well, actually, what you know, when when people said they were looking at a dendritic cell or a Langerhans cell in 1985 or 2002 or 2010, actually they were looking at something different. And, we've, and we actually wrote a really nice review on this where we reintegrated the past literature based on our um, on our new understanding. So finally, I just want to talk a little bit about where we've now gone in terms of quantitating. So the, so the nice thing about flow cytometry, as a Sui said, it is so quantitative, whereas imaging tends to be qualitative. Um, so, but the fact that we now had this nice RNA scope system set up meant that we could then quantitate, be begin quantitative um, in situ studies. But there's many, many different problems that you come across when you're imaging in human tissue. Again, you can't make these nice mice that, are, that have a dendritic cell that goes green. You're, you're, you are just stuck with a piece of human tissue, which is completely raw. You get lots of autofluorescence. So one of the things we did was we designed a bioinformatic algorithm which will remove all of the autofluorescence from your tissue post acquisition. And you can see here an example of some tissue before and before the autofluorescence removal. And when, you, when we apply this algorithm, all of this background autofluorescence gets removed. This is important because these would all be considered false positives. We also use an, 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 another problem with when you're looking at human tissue is that lots of the, all the cells overlap with each other. And in the past, it's been very difficult to, to, to really define where does one cell begin and where does one cell end. And we did, we designed another cell body expanding algorithm, which allowed us to, con which enabled us within our analysis pipeline to um, to be able to use overlapping cells and to precisely identify where the cell boundaries are. And finally, we developed another algorithm, which enabled a basically a, 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 a program to compare the cell distribution between different parts of tissue or tissue that's say infected with HIV or uninfected with HIV. So what this, you can see how really nice and quantitative this is. This, this is showing dendritic cells and macrophages and T cells containing one HIV particle, three, six, or 12. It's very, very precise. And what we were able to show here is that even though CD4 T cells are considered the primary HIV target cell, it's actually the dendritic cells in green, which are containing most HIV virions. Again, this is between 30 and two hours post um, application of the virus. And actually, there's more dendritic cells that contain 15 virus particles than there are that contain one. So we're really able to definitively show that dendritic cells are the key HIV target cell at these very, very early time points. And we were also able to show using this spicy R algorithm that if you look at this HIV negative region of the tissue, the dendritic cells, T cells and macrophages are very evenly distributed, whereas in the HIV positive regions, all of these HIV target cells cluster together. So something about the virus being there makes its target cells cluster together. And this is what allows the dendritic cells you can see here in green. Posey up to the T cells and they actually transmit the virus to the T cell. Which is, the, which is the primary HIV target cell. And you can see these lovely images of, a, as I say, a T cell in blue, a dendritic cell in green, with these virions 
um, again, we could quantitate this, the virions are almost always at the interface between these two cells. So you're really able to see this virus trafficking between cells and the actual transmission events occurring. And Heva published this lovely study at the end of his PhD um, in cell reports last year. Obviously, there's a lot more to the study than that, but that's just a few highlights of how we've used being at Westmead and the core facilities to great research. Thank you, Andrew. So I hope I'll just quickly close, stop sharing. So I hope that's given everybody a nice overview of not only what our core facilities um, include here at Westmead and what we have to offer. It's important to note that it's not just the technologies that we have, but the great minds that drive these technologies and also the proximity to the hospital and the clinician researchers that we have here that make it such a unique um, opportunity to network um, here at Westmead. So if you do have any questions, we're going to be spending a bit of time outside now with some food so that we can um, network and chat and you can ask any questions of any of the core facility lab managers that are here today. And if you've got any other questions, if you're online and you aren't able to join us for the networking, you can send us an email um, and I will be putting the uh, recording of today's session online so you can refer back to it at uh, another time. So thank you all for coming today and uh, we'll go outside and chat and have something to eat. Thanks very much.